we're introducing using practical tools and the technologies. Um, so this has come about as a part of a series. So we've already done a session teaching tools for the technology series. And we've already done a session on Tinkercad and that's now available as a webinar. We're looking at all the technologies, E's and O's, from early level to second level and thinking about how we can um, help support teachers to teach those E's and O's because they've not really previously been focused on an awful lot. Um, there's been a lot of work done in science education, but not so much in the technology. So that's what this series is about. Um, for this session, we're going to look at why it's important to explore tool use in the classroom. Um, what does the use of tools bring to our young people? What do we mean by tools in the classroom? Um, how can we introduce more tools, which is probably why you're all here because you're looking to increase the use of tools in your classrooms? Um, and how do we use these tools? Um, how do we manage them in our classroom? We'll look at some practical examples of that too. So why tools in our classroom? I'm going to go through this. I know that you, you guys are probably here because um, you're keen to introduce tools into your classroom, but it might be that you might need to persuade some other people in your school to come on board with your way of thinking. So I'm going to go through why it's important that we think about tools in the classroom, just so that you have more information for your case to try and build that in your school, if that's the position you're in. So gross and fine motor skills um, are linked to physical, social and psychological development. And through the use of tools, we are improving and refining our gross and fine motor skills. Um, so there is definite scope for um, then improving writing, um, improving um, PE abilities too. Um, so it's not to be um, underrated that the tools, use of tools is actually improving other parts of the curriculum too. If we think about play-based learning, and I know a lot of you all know that that's been introduced in large scale in early years, but actually um, it's relevant all the way through education and we probably call it project-based learning as we get it to the, the top of primary school and into BGE and then further up the secondary school. But play-based learning is, is well known to um, offer pupils more time for engagement and actually it allows them to improve their language skills through discussion about what they're doing. Um, it can improve their numeracy because it can be applied numeracy that they're looking at um, rather than um, book numeracy. So play-based and project-based learning is something that um, tools can offer you in your classroom. If you think about inclusive pedagogy to enable all learners to thrive, we have to look at different approaches to allow, allow everybody to engage with education and using tools could be a way to do that. We also need to think about um, gender balance and equalities and equity in our classroom um, and perhaps tools and the use of tools is something that can allow us to explore those um, things too. If we think about skills for life, learning and work, another strand to, to the work that we're expected to, um, to drive forward in our primary and secondary schools, tools could be a huge part of this. There, there are very, very apparent links to the real world and the use of tools. And then if we think about real life careers education, so if we introduce real life tools into our classrooms, then pupils are getting the, the feeling of what it would be like to do that job in real life, even past the point of being in school. If we think about our E's and O's, so the two E's and O's that we're looking at in relation to tools, um, they're not actually described in the E's and O's themselves, but if you look at the benchmarks for TCH09, um, and that's at early first and second level, it's the same um, E's and O's. And then also we're looking at the benchmark for materials as well, because the two don't really um, they can't really be dealt with separately, they pretty much come hand in hand. And again, it's in the benchmarks, but it's not necessarily in the actual e &O itself. So in the benchmarks, the expectation is that we're building models, we're creating solutions to problems, and we're using tools and equipment. And the complexity of that increases as we go from our early level up to second level. And the use of materials is the same. So we're looking at materials and exploring them at early level, then identifying them and then suggesting uses for them by the time we get to second level. You can you can already see that if you're using tools um, with different materials, then you are going to be um, enabling your learners to explore these concepts. So what do we mean by tools? Hopefully Jenny can put in the chat for us a poll um, where there are various things that I've asked if you think are relevant. Um, perhaps if you could respond to the poll that Jenny's going to put in. 
which of these things would you associate with tools? If you just tick the boxes and submit your vote, then we should get the live results on the bottom of the screen. If you can have a look at the chat for me. Oh, there's a the second part to the poll as well. Um, yeah, so the first part of the poll we're looking at um, scissors, paper, hammers, axes, woodwork, outdoor learning. So the majority of us are thinking all of those things, but not necessarily outdoor learning. Um, we'll discuss why outdoor learning might be a useful avenue to maybe explore with your tools. Um, but I would say all of those are equally as relevant. Um, the axes actually come into your outdoor learning, which is why I've mentioned them there. Um, and the bottom pole, yeah, excellent. I'm so pleased that everybody agrees that creativity is, is one of the main reasons for using tools. That is, that's what we're going to be promoting a lot through in, um, the rest of the discussions this afternoon. Um, yeah, there is an element of danger, but actually it's a lot less than you would think. Fun, yes. And mess. I can't believe everybody doesn't think that tools are going to be messy. They are so messy, but it's great. It's great fun. Um, those who've said something else, do you fancy putting in the chat what you mean by something else? Is there something else you associate with tools that's not mentioned there? You don't have to. I just wondered out of interest. Yep. Problem solving, vocational link. Yep. Excellent. So all those things we've discussed already, that these are the reasons why we're, why we're trying to use tools, new experiences beyond the norm, exploring and exploration. Excellent. Yep. I'm so pleased that you say these things because th this is what I'm going to talk about now. So um, if I go back to my presentation. So if we think about the benchmarks that I put up earlier, if I, if I summarise what those benchmarks are looking for and what we can use tools to provide as we're looking at project based learning, um, so the benchmarks are looking for us to use a range of tools and um, they're looking for us to work with various materials to explore joining methods, which is quite an important one and one that we maybe overlook somewhat and um, to play and um, provide skills for life learning and work and to be real life. So I'm going to show you an example of a project that we ran in Falkirk and um, I think it ran in Edinburgh as well this year and um, it was made by the Small Peace Trust and sponsored by the RAF. Um, it's a challenge where people had to design a, a glider out of basic um, materials. And actually the only tools they had were a pair of scissors. Um, but the materials they were given were some cardboard, paper, tissue paper, lollipop sticks, um, dowel, which is a wooden rod for those of you who um, haven't used those before, blue tack, sellotape, double-sided tape and masking tape. Um, and you will see if I show you this short video from um, Twitter, there is no sound on this. Um, that these pupils were very much engaged in trying to build their little model um, RAF planes, glider planes. They weren't motorised. Um, gliders are usually towed behind a plane and then let go and they float to the, the ground. Um, so they were experimenting with a lot of these materials and a lot of the class, this is a P5 class, a lot of the class had never used some of these, so they'd never used dowels before. They'd never thought about using blue tack other than to pin something on the wall. Um, the tissue paper, they all, without fail, scrumpled the tissue paper up and made it into little balls to make a collage. Um, they had no idea what else to do with it other than that. Um, but you can see some of the model making is really, really effective. And it, I mean, this is real life model making. This is what you would do in industry if you were an engineer. You wouldn't straight away get your woodwork tools out. You would probably be building in paper and card initially as well. So I just want to, to demonstrate that, that this is really as valid an approach to looking at tools um, as it would be if you were looking at um, woodwork, which is what everybody jumps to straight away. This could be an equally valid approach. So the pupils had to build a little glider plane. There's a, a glider plane there with uh, some paper and a lolly stick in the middle. What are the things we could have explored with joining methods or with um, approaches um, and exploration of tools? We could have thought about how are you making those wings symmetrical? So at the bottom, they could just cut out the shape that they wanted for the wings and stick the little pop stick in the middle. But how do you know that it's symmetrical? Have you actually used a compass to draw that? That would be introduction of another tool. Have you measured where the middle is so that you can draw that arc equally? Or they could have drawn half the arc and folded the paper in half. Um, or they could have used uh, one bit of wing as a template and then drawn a second one. And so that's the introduction of templates, which is part of what we would introduce as tools um, in secondary school. Um, you could think about using cardboard. Are we talking about the material and how it can be used as a tool as well and um, the appropriate methods of using cardboard? So um, cardboard has a grain in it, 
I don't know if you'd be familiar with that. So that's um, the lines on the cardboard um, or the tubes in the middle of the cardboard go in one direction. It's easier to cut in that direction. If you cut against the, the, the grain of the cardboard, you get um, misshapen cardboard. So maybe you could be instructing pupils, that, you know, what benefits are there to cutting with the grain? And then also if you fold along the grain of cardboard, you can make curved structures. So perhaps there's an exploration of material and using cardboard as a tool because you can use it to make curves in which you wouldn't necessarily automatically think about. So there is a lot of scope for using tools, just scissors and some very basic things, and um, using your materials as tools at that level. So if you feel that woodwork is, is too far a step, then there is there, there are options there, but it's about trying to explore joining methods and think about um, what you can use your materials for. So if we look at um, beyond cardboard modelling and junk modelling and think about woodwork, there are lots of benefits. Um, I'm going to show you this little video. Um, Pete Murray is a huge advocate for the use of tools in um, the classroom. He's done a lot of work with early years. He's now promoting it in England um, and actually across, across the globe in primary schools. Um, he's given me permission to show this video of his, um, but also there's a link on the presentation which will be up afterwards so that you can have a look at his website if you um, want more information on what he's been up to. The Big Bang Project is an initiative really to encourage and promote woodwork in early childhood education. Woodwork is learning and doing. It's really hands, mind and heart working together. It really does bring in all areas of learning and development from that sort of mathematical and scientific thinking through their you know, understanding the world and the basic technology of using tools, the, the rich physical development of using sort of fine and gross motor skills as well as the, the, the language and communication and that sort of personal development and social development that happens. It's really an all-encompassing activity. It's a real delight to, to see children deeply engaged in the woodwork and you can just know what a real impact that's having within the child in terms of their, their personal development, their self-esteem and confidence, and their growing sense of autonomy and sense of agency, really, that they get when they you know, essentially put their ideas into action. Working with, with real wood and real tools really just captures the imagination of what the possibilities are. The emphasis is placed on, on creative woodwork. When children are making what they want to make, we find that they've got that intrinsic motivation to persevere and find solutions to, the, to their own problems and really resolve their work. And I think this is what really leads itself to these high levels of uh, sustained engagement. These things um, on the fly makes it go to steam out of the chimney. It's easy to marvel at what children make. I mean, they make the most extraordinary um, models and constructions, but what's really been made with woodwork is, is within the child. That's the real transformation, is the, is the personal development. That's very much at the heart of woodwork. Any experience when children are in that state of flow, using their creative and critical thinking skills, this is known to have a, a real deep impact on, on children's sense of well-being. Well done, that's fantastic. I'm good at it. It's easy to feel a little apprehensive at the thought of, of children using real tools, but actually with, with, the, with the correct introduction to, to the most appropriate tools, and we're putting some very basic health and safety measures in place, it's actually surprisingly safe. It's really important that children learn to, to manage risks and make, learn to make choices and decisions for themselves that help better protect themselves. This is a really important part of child development. There isn't an extensive amount of equipment that's needed, just a, a limited um, selection of basic tools. And of course, a good, solid, sturdy um, workbench is important. We're just really taking advantage of, of recycled materials and offcuts of wood, combined with a variety of other, you know, other materials, such as bottle tops and corks and so forth. What's really stood out from, from my travels around the world observing woodwork provision is that it's a universal language. The, the data also highlights the, the cross-curricular nature of woodwork, how it embraces all areas of learning. And this is evidence that I found in all countries, from Finland to Japan to New Zealand. 
teachers have really found that woodwork is exceptional for, for engaging children that typically find it hard to, to concentrate and focus within the classroom. I think it would be wonderful for, for all children to have the experience of working with real tools and with wood. Today, it's, it's more important than ever that we do provide you know, these opportunities for children to have really rich experiential learning. So I don't know about you, but that just just totally inspires me. I can't think of why a, a good reason why you wouldn't want to have those experiences for children in classrooms. Um, and as you can see, th so those were early years experiences that were being filmed there. So that's um, three and four year olds. Um, so and if you look at the projects and the variations of things they've managed to create, it's just absolutely amazing. So if you think what our our pupils could be doing in, in primary school and then into secondary school, it could be absolutely fantastic if we've got this provision from the beginning right through school. So how can we introduce more tools into the classroom? So this is still part of your case for how you, you push this in your school. So perhaps you show your colleagues that video um, as a, a starter and then if you need to convince your senior management in your school and um, how are we going to get the resources, how are we going to get some money for this, well, how does this integrate into what we're doing as a school, you might want to try and affect your um, school improvement plan. Um, if you look at the STEM self-evaluation improvement framework, um, the link's on the bottom of this, of this page here. Um, if you've not seen it before, it's a document that allows you to evaluate, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, it allows you to evaluate STEM in your school and the provision of STEM in your school. It links in directly with the quality indicators for HEGEOS as well. Um, so it's not just about STEM, but this document does focus on STEM. So if we look at quality indicator 1.5 in the self-evaluation self improvement framework, this is about management of resources to promote equity. So you could make an argument that actually we need more resources in our school to promote equity. Um, the pupils at home are not necessarily getting these experiences. There's not an, an equity of experience at home. So we need to provide that as a school. That could be one of your arguments. Quality indicator 2.2 is around curricul curriculum design and rationale um, to focus on STEM rather than standalone science. So perhaps you, you've worked a lot on science in your school and you need to think about the, um, the rest of the aspects here. So technologies, engineering and maths and woodwork would fit perfectly into that. If you think about the development of curriculum into um, includes DYW and parents, community involvement, all of this is a quality indicator 2.2. Um, learner pathways, pedagogy and play, um, providing progression, skills for life learning and work, that's all under that quality indicator. And we've already discussed how much how many of these things are covered by using um, woodwork or tools in your school. Quality indicator 2.5, uh, family learning opportunities. There are endless opportunities for en engaging family in this. It could be that there are families who are working with wood in their um, profession, in their job. It may be that it's a very engaging thing to have families in to participate in the school because it's very hands-on, um, tangible and something quite exciting to get involved in. And quality indicator 2.6, transition from early years to primary and primary to secondary. There's a lot of work has been done in early years to um, promote the use of woodwork. Um, and there is provision in secondary, most in secondary schools for the use of woodwork and tools. And how are we bridging that gap in our primaries um, to make sure that there is clear provision and progression right the way through our pupils' lives? Perhaps that's something you could use to um, bolster your argument. On a practical level, so we've talked about the fact that um, you could be using basic tools. So you could think about scissors and maybe you're introducing more materials into your classroom. So sellotape, double sided sellotape is my six year old's most um, loved thing in her house. She makes everything with double sided sellotape because she thinks it's just the most magical thing. Perhaps the introduction of double sided sellotape into your school would be an, an improvement. Um, but like I said, with the, the glider challenge, we need to think about um, do we think about modelling techniques and um, joining techniques? The reason I've highlighted modelling techniques um, is and joining methods is because these are the things that you could search for. You can see up at the top here, there's an image of cardboard attachments and that there are different ways you can attach um, cardboard together. So is it that you've got a toilet roll tube and you need to make some, some flanges on the bottom to be able to join that effectively to a box? 
you know, you're teaching modelling methods, modelling techniques, so perhaps that's enhancing the provision in itself without the investment in more tools. Maybe you want to go beyond that. Um, Make Do are an American company. Nope. Um, I'll show you a little video. I am not getting paid by Make Do, and there are lots of other um, companies who do a similar thing. <laughs> So make do um, sell sets of those little um, blue screws that you saw there. They also sell uh, screwdrivers to go with them and you can use them to model with cardboard, but introducing a tool of a screwdriver and um, those little screws. So, you know, it's, it's a relatively basic um, addition to your kit, um, but could take you that step further. And then you know, a lot of your schools maybe potentially already have things like Meccano or Connects or similar things where you've got um, kits where things join together. You can join things together with um, screws, with parts, and that's, that's a step beyond junk modeling and thinking about um, use, using tools, maybe screwdrivers. If we think to woodwork then, which would be the next step, um, you could introduce um, tools on a, a sliding scale. So the introduction that you saw there, um, the pupils were using all of these tools in the early years. Um, but if you think about using hammers and nails first, then screws and screwdrivers, then drills, then saws, that would be the progression of, of uh, work within woodwork. So you could invest in hammers and nails initially and see how that goes. Can you can you sustain that as in a school? Does that work as an approach for your school? And then you could think about going on to screws and screwdrivers. Then you could think about drills and then you could think about saws. You don't have to jump in with both feet all at the same time. I've got a list here um, that has been put together by myself and the rest of the RAISE officers in Scotland. And on this list, you can find what woodwork tools might be useful to start out. So you saw an image on Pete Moorhouse's video there, what tools he would recommend to get started with. We've got a tools list, um, which is shared on that link in the presentation, which will be available to you. Um, and on this list, it has um, an image of what the tool looks like and a little bit of information about um, that tool. So how much it costs, why it's useful, why would you use that tool over something else? So this document looks like this, it has a picture of the tool, um, it shows you a little bit of information about it, a rough cost, obviously costs fluctuate all the time, so there's no way that I could put a link in there. Um, and I haven't put a link to a supplier either because um, you should shop around because they vary in price all the time. So all those main tools that Pete showed on there, um, and that I would advocate as well, are shown on here. And again, you wouldn't have to invest in them all, you could start with nails and hammers. Only recommendation I would have is that you do invest in this Be Safe book, um, and we'll come on to that in a second. Um, the other thing to think about is parental or community engagement. So like I said, you could have parents who are um, working in industry or who have tools at hand at home. Maybe this is something they do as a hobby. Maybe there is a, a business which is um, very close to you um, and they uh, might have odds and ends of wood or materials or tools. It might be worth thinking about engaging them at an early stage to see if they can help you out or provide any um, support for you. The RAISE Network in Scotland have produced um, health and safety sheets for pupils and teachers of each of the different tools. Um, and there are videos to go alongside these. So you don't actually need formal training if you're to use hand tools at all. Um, but obviously that would be something that's useful. But realistically, not every school can afford to pay for training. Training courses can be um, very expensive for schools to invest in. Um, and it's maybe not something that everybody in the school wants to do initially. So we've produced these resources, these videos and these support sheets in a bid that you um, could potentially self-train yourself um, or actually have a cat session with your school. Um, and you could go through these together as a, as a team. So these information sheets, there's one for every tool, um, shows a picture of the tool. The QR code here leads to a video showing you how to use that tool. I'll show you one of them in a second. 
um, main safety checks that should be done with that tool every time you take it out. So you want to count how many of each tool you've had, so none go missing. Um, make sure that it's not broken, so the head's not going to fall off the tool. Um, check there's no dents in the hitting surface of the hammer, and check there's no loose parts in the hand handle. So if you're using this extensively, you don't want to get blisters because the handle's actually got a loose covering on it. Safety reminders, and then teaching points. So the recommendation would be that you teach each tool at a time, one at a time. Um, and these are the main teaching points for this particular tool. Additional points are for the teacher's interest, maybe um, answering some questions you might get from um, your enthusiastic pupils. And these sheets have been created so that they could also be used by pupils. So the first one is intended to be kind of second level um, or teacher uh, use. The second sheet is supposed to be for pupils. So we've looked at more graphic um, representations of your teaching points and just looking at the main ones that might help them out um, to try and make it more adaptable for pupils. And then we have a blank version at the bottom. So you might want to recap your use of tools with a class who've done this in a previous year and perhaps there to create the safety checks and the teaching points for that particular tool. And you're thinking about their health and well-being and their responsibility and their um, assessing of risk themselves. That's something that they could potentially complete. So all the tool sheets take the exact same format so that there's some consistency there. And this is potentially something that you could use to um, help your, uh, learn yourself or to help the um, other practitioners in your school get some confidence with using these tools. So these all were made at home during lockdown in my life. There are a full playlist of these videos. Most of them are not very long. I mean, that's one minute long in total. Um, these videos are intended for teachers to self-learn, but also you could use them for pupils in class. You could show them so that they can um, have an idea of what it is they have to do with that tool. Um, these have been approved by CERC, or the Health and Safety Body in um, Scotland. Um, they've had a look at all the videos and the um, worksheets and the tool talk um, support sheets, um, and they have approved them. So um, you can have some confidence that if you're using these, then um, they are the right advice for you. If you are in any doubt while you're using um, tools in school, um, you could either contact your RAISE officer if you have one in your region. Otherwise, you can consult CERC. So CERC is spelled S-S-E-R-C -S and it's an abbreviation. And they are the health and safety body for um, the support of science and technology in um, both primary and secondary schools in Scotland. So any questions at all, consult them. They have an advisory service that you can phone up, ask any question, and they um, will get back to you on that. Be Safe book is um, what I was talking about before. So this is a publication by ASE, which is actually the equivalent of CERC in England, but CERC have also supported this publication. And it's a guide for health and safety in science and technology, so actually useful outside of tools as well, um, in education for three to 12 year olds in Scotland. Um, so there are some risk assessments in there, but there's also general guidance on the use of tools. All the guidance in our um, guidance sheets for the tools and the videos um, are in line with what's in the Be Safe book, but it would be a useful thing for you to have in your school for reference. Um, gives you advice about like you shouldn't really use craft nice unless you're talking about the very top end of a second level and only responsible pupils. Um, it gives you advice about the use of egg boxes um, and how to do a risk assessment for egg boxes if you're junk modelling. So it's worth an, um, a look as well. We've got some sample risk assessments, a demonstration of um, what your risk assessment could look like. So sorry, this is a, an excerpt from the Be Safe book. So this is the kind of guidance that you can get. General cutting use of craft knives should be limited to upper school. Um, so there is health and safety guidance also um, and some sample risk assessments that you could reference. 
How do we manage the tools around the classroom? So, as I said already, we've got these tool sheets which introduce each of the tools. So I think that would probably be the best approach to start with. So think about using one tool and do a tool talk on that tool. So describe for the pupils how to use it, all the features of that tool, um, and maybe actually use the tool with that pupil, with those pupils. And have a checklist perhaps um, of which pupils have completed which basic training so that then you as a teacher can keep an eye on, on well we've never used a hammer with this pupil so we'll need to go and introduce it again to him and you can use those tools information sheets to structure that so that they have a consistent approach um, from everybody in your school and then once you've taught the pupils how to use one tool so you could teach them how to use a hammer with some nails they could go straight ahead and go build a project with that. Perhaps you're studying spiders in school and you decide, right, OK, we're going to go and get some hammers and nails and some blocks of wood and we're going to make spiders. So we get a block of wood and we hammer some nails in to make legs for the spiders. And um, you could then look at second level and perhaps you want it to be a little bit more advanced. Oh, well, we're going to use our nails and hammers and we're going to go and build some bird boxes. If you look online, there are instructions that you can find on the RSPB website to build a bird box. You could follow those simple instructions, use some hammers and nails and some bits of wood. You could perhaps get a parent or somebody else to cut up the wood for you, perhaps even your high school, and you could go ahead and make those bird boxes with using hammering and nails. If you think about um, how you would manage this in your classroom with small group access, so just like you do with your reading groups, perhaps you want to have um, only five pupils are going to use these tools at this particular time and the other pupils are going off doing another task. Perhaps you've got other things going on in your classroom and you want them to have um, access to tools in smaller groups. You could set up as a carousel activity, so you could set up stations, different tools at each station um, or two related tasks at each station, dependent on the pupil uh, mix, teacher confidence, class size and risk assessment. So this is an example of what it could look like if you were going to cover hammering with your class one day. So you could have one station where you are with the pupils who've got the hammers, if you're just introducing them um, to hammers initially. You could have that station under your supervision the whole time. Um, you could have your hammers, your nails and some wood there for you to um, go through the tool talk with those pupils. You could have another um, five stations around the room. You could have a station with materials. Perhaps pupils just place materials together, create design for a project. So they get a block of wood and they put some uh, bottle tops on it or some other smaller parts of wood and they put some nails on top just laying it all on top of each other and they take a photograph with their ipad and that's what they're going to try and make once they get access to the hammers you could have another station where they have the tool safety sheets maybe it's made into a jigsaw maybe you have some qu uh, questions that you set them based on that and um, for them to answer you have a station where they watch the video um, of the tool being used and um, so the links for them are all these tool information sheets because we're working with nails and hammers, you could have a, a piece of cardboard even or a piece of wood with nails pushed into it in a pattern and they have to string wrap around the pattern. If you're looking to change this up for a second level, you could have um, that they need to work at the minimum number of nails to make a particular letter. So they're looking at budgeting and how they can make their project more economical. Um, and you could have a project which is already made with nails and um, wood and the pupils could do some number talks around that. So how many num how many nails are there there? Um, are there lots of big nails, lots of little nails? Um, could It could be just counting for early level, but then up to second level, it could be what's the cost of this, this project? And what budget would you set for this project based around what materials are being used for it? So that's carousel activities. I put at the bottom here, be prepared for mess. Because there are lots of activities going on and you've got lots of materials out, this is probably going to be quite a messy endeavour. I have seen in a classroom, which has been a really successful setup, that they've set their whole classroom up as a design studio. This is maybe quite an advanced thing and you, have, you would have to invest in this significantly as, as a model of working in your classroom. But they had a um, design and make model task that the whole class was set. Um, and then it was broken down into designing, researching, exploring with a tinker table. So they had products that were similar to the product they were designing. They had to use screwdrivers and what have you to take the product apart so they could explore relevant products um, with regards to the design that they were creating. 
they could be modeling in cardboard, wood, and using tools. Um, and then they could evaluate what they've created by asking um, other people in the class to um, give feedback on, on their creation. And then they could be working on a presentation to give a sort of Dragon's Den style presentation on what they've created. Um, so that would be the whole process, but pupils would advance through that at different rates. You would end up with different pupils at different stations at different times. And then that would kind of give you a, a, um, a natural carousel activity. The other option is that you could think about using your outdoor space, and this might give opportunity for larger scale or group projects. One of the schools I visited had lots of pallets, and the reason that they had me in to talk to them about tools is because they wanted to actually build a hut for the pupils. At the moment, the pupils have got the pallets stacked up um, and they've got them tied together with string, but they actually wanted to make, with hammer and nails, a little hut for their garden. So perhaps there is a, a larger scale project you could do. Maybe there's a community project you could do. Could there do with some planters outside your school um, to improve the look of the, the approach to the school. Um, could you sell the planters locally? Is there an enterprise activity? This could grow arms and legs very quickly. Um, but there are opportunities if you think about this for outdoor learning too. So that was a whistle stop tour. And I, I, these are, this is my contact email address. And Jenny Kai is from the Digital Team in Education Scotland. So she's producing this series of um, events with me. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email them to us. We will put this presentation up um, and the video will go live as a webinar as well, recorded webinar. Um, and then also, if you want to get in touch with us, you can use our Twitter handles um, and you can direct message us through that.